Hey guys, so we've kind of talked about one Primark already and really in our pursuit to cover all the Primarchs as a whole, I realized that it might be a little confusing for anyone coming into this fresh. Uh, there's a lot of names, interactions, and dealings with uh, all the individual Primarchs. And some are far closer than others, like Sanguinius, for, for example, he's got this strong fraternal connection to Horus, or the legendary feud between Lehman, Lehman Russ and really any Primarch for that matter. But really, all jokes aside, the, the, the big feud between Lehman Russ and Magnus the Red. So. In today's video, we will cover each Primarch and their respective home planet, their legion's number and name, as well as just some quick characteristics of the legion as a whole. Nothing too in-depth. That's the big thing here. This will act as sort of a primer of the individual videos as a whole. So this way, you know, here's like a reference sheet for any of you who don't really know anything about Warhammer 30,000 lore, or you're, you're just kind of as a whole coming into this just completely naked, like, you know, like I am right now. That's how I like to record. It helps me breathe. But we'll go into the very first Primarch that we, we've already we talked about. And this is not the very first Primarch I found. This is just the first Legion. We're going to go at this by Legion number. So the first Legion is Lionel Johnson, the first of the Lion. And we've already really covered the Lion in our first Primarch video. But for the sake of consistency and just kind of maybe a basic example of how the format of this is going to be, let's just dive into this real fast. So he's originally from the Death World of Caliban, which we've talked about. But Lionel Johnson is the Primarch of the Dark Angel Legion, our Dark Angels Legion, now, a legion known for its uh, hexagrammaton, and we've, or the host that we talked about, Deathwing and Ravenwing, making up the remainder of the hexagrammaton that we see in today's Dark Angel roster, Dark Angels Codex. So, when you think Dark Angels, you think Elite Terminators, Land Speeders, and Attack Bikes. Really, the Dark Angels, though, were once that, that consummate legion, and now their chapter is shrouded in mystery as they attempt to you know, hide the truths of the events that unfolded in the Horus Heresy. Uh, you know, via uh, Luther and the such. But that's that's how we're going to do this. That's the first one. Template set. So let's jump into the second legion, which is actually deleted. So the first of our deleted Primarchs, as it were. And in the original lore, there were two Primarchs that were quote-unquote deleted from Imperial history. Uh, Games Workshop had used this as a chance for the players to really fill the void and sort of create their own legions. Like, hey, you know, we, we've attributed for 18 of the 20, Let's see what you guys can come with, come up with. But as the lore of the Horus Heresy is really starting to flesh out with the books, we hear more and more about how these legions were once known to the other Primarchs and were put down by the Emperor or even Lehman Russ. So depending on what book you're reading, it's generally accepted that there was either a corruption that befell the legion early, or they felt a chaos, or somehow corrupted the goal of the Crusade. There's there's more to come on this in the coming books, and it's still quite a mystery, but. There's a lot of, like, every time someone says, like, well, what if we worshipped a bunch of gods? Someone would be like, hey, man, shut up. You you remember what happened to number two. Fucker's dead somewhere. But that's just to give you an idea here. That this is the, the, There's another legion that's going to be just like this, but we know now that the second legion is deleted. The third legion, though, uh, f is uh, Fulgrim, or that's the, the Primarch, is Fulgrim, the Phoenician. And he's the maths master of the Third Legion. And Fulgrim is known for his skill in both pursuits of war and an art. He hails from the world of uh, Chemos, Chemos, uh, C-H-E-M-O-S. And Fulgrim's history follows that of almost this Renaissance-esque warrior. You know, he, he creates these grand friscos and battle plans all in this kind of same breath. And uh, the Emperor's Children, the, the name of this, the Third Legion, um, as a whole pursue perfection in all forms and all avenues everything they put their minds to they, they, it has to be perfected there's some parts in the the early lore um, where it talks about how um, some of them are great singers some of them are great artists or sculptors they take up these pursuits they need to have it perfected down to the minutia but this obsession and fascination with perfection as well as their their pride as, as a as a whole eventually leads to their downfall as they fall to the whims of slanesh and the sins of the flesh you know not being too far from their minds, something that Sinesh certainly digs hard. Uh, no pun intended on that one, but that's uh, Fulgrim's The Emperor's Children. It's kind of fun to be able to use that deep, sick voice like, mm, The Emperor's Children for the Emperor. But uh, for the Fourth Legion, uh, the Iron Warriors, we have uh, Perturabo, the Lord of Iron. And Perturabo leads the Mighty Iron Warriors uh, from the planet of Olympia. It's a it's very different. Uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Perturabo was very different 
um, in his youth than he is now. Uh, Pertrabo uh, grows up to eventually become this rather aloof and removed individual. In his youth, he was a lot more, uh, um, a lot more, uh, um, uh, not illustrious, but he was way more outgoing and way more like, hey, we want to do all these things for the good uh, of, of mankind and everything like that. And he kind of gets a little jaded in the whole pursuit of freeing his uh, planet. And we're going to find this theme very uh, repeated through every single Primarch. There's this constant theme of freeing their planet from oppression or, free, or, or uh, basically rising to the fore of their planet like we saw in Lionel, Lionel Johnson video. But many of his brothers really don't get along with him and they don't really seek, and he doesn't really seek their affection at the same time. Uh, Pertrabo is pretty much a, uh, a sole entity in the fact that he's not going out of his way to create this whole uh, bromance that exists throughout the entire space opera that is the Horus Heresy. But the Iron Warriors themselves are these kind of famed fortress builders and experts in siegecraft. And throughout the Horus Heresy, or even in the uh, Great Crusade, and even in the, the actual Great Crusade itself, they were used to crack the hardest planets and defenses. And Perturabo's initial frustrations with the Emperor stems from that exact use, you know, being only thrown into high-risk sieges or the all-out defense of an otherwise doomed fortress. So there is a high amount of attrition that was attributed to these actions. So while he does not get along with most, his hatred for Rogel Dorn is without peer, as it is uh, said that if either one could build an impenetrable fortress, the other could actually crack it open. Number five, though, uh, Jagatai Khan, who is uh, the Great Khan, uh, the, the leader of the White Scars. So Jagoris is a planet not unlike Terra in its days of antiquity, a land of, you know, horse lords. Uh, Jagatai Khan comes from a culture very similar to the Mongols of the Gordon, Golden Horde. Uh, his name, a direct reference to the rulers of that civilization. But Jagatai has always been pretty enigmatic in this series until late, as the Horus Heresy really starts to reveal a lot of the honor and duty behind the Great Khan, and he was a relatively minor Primarch in the olden days, uh, so it goes, it, it's kind of great to see him finally get some some light, some, some fleshing out of. And the White Scars themselves have this sort of ritual scar that's put on them when they ascend fully into the Legion. And you'd never guess with a name like that, huh? Yeah, because I know I didn't. But they are uh, actually considered pretty barbaric by their counterparts in the Imperium, as they still hold true to their uh, very tribal roots, uh, not unlike the Space Wolves. I mean, they've, they've got kind of like a shamanistic cast. Uh, they, didn't, they did not get rid of their librarians with the Nikean Creed. They didn't really care about it. They said, no, we're going to keep doing our traditions. Um, but they're very much about hit-and-run type tactics mounted on bikes, and you know, just in the same way that you would have a Mongolian uh, uh, horse archer. That's the kind of same theme here. we got these... A uh, very mechanized army in the sense of it all being on, uh, well, not all of it, but a lot of it being on bikes with these huge glaives and everything like that. But the White Scars are talked about throughout the books as being a bit of a, a tipping point for the heresy. You know, whichever route they take will really determine the outcome of the fight. And we'll we'll go into that a little bit more when we jump into the uh, the video for the Great Khan. But since we have mentioned uh, Space Wolves, we'll jump into number six, Lehman Russ, the Wolf King. And really, a man that needs no introduction. Uh, Lehman Russ is the Emperor's executioner and lord of the, and I'm going to butcher the hell out of this, uh, Volka Fenrika. Uh, that's basically Space Wolves. Um, but hailing the, the he uh, hails from the, this death world of Fenris. And the Space Wolves are more space Vikings than anything. And Fenris is this pretty insane planet with constantly shifting tectonic plates that swallow up and spit out islands at random from the sea with these huge legendary sea monsters, very uh, Beowulf-esque. But Lehman Russ is unflinchingly loyal to the Emperor, and his legion follows suit, sometimes eschewing uh, other portions of the Imperium in service of the Emperor as a whole. Like in in the later portions, in what, what would you consider as eighth, or, um, current day 8th edition, uh, 40k millennium, or the 41st millennium, the Space Wolves often have run-ins with the Inquisition. Like, hey, you guys are traitors. It's like, no, we just believe in the Emperor above all else. You guys are, are not the Emperor. We're not going to listen to you. Uh, they have a lot of run-ins with them. Um, actually, the, the whole faction as a whole, the whole chapter as a whole, is very distant from the Codex Astartes. And... Uh, it's important to note that because they, they are very tribal in a lot of ways. They have these rune smiths, um, I'm sorry, rune priests. No, they don't have the typical librarians. They have a very different way of doing things. And it's uh, the whole army itself is very characteristic of that and really cool looking, really, really cool looking. The Space Wolves stand out amongst most of the Space Marine chapters as having a really kind of custom touch to it. 
The Blood Angels have their really cool big wings. The Dark Angels have their, their rad robes. The, the, the Ultramarines have their leather. And then the, the uh, Space Wolves are just draped in wolf pelts. They have a lot of character to their army. And I really love the way the Space Wolves look. But uh, Lehman Rusterly is dispatched to bring uh, Magnus the Red to answer because uh, Magnus the Red violates the, the Edict of Nikea. And as the Emperor's kind of executioner, you can imagine what that meant for the two legions that uh, you'll find out more about as we go into those videos. <laughs> Not to spoil anything, but uh, we'll get into number seven here, Rogel Dorn, the Emperor's champion. And the Praetorian, the Praetorian of Terra was raised on the planet of Inuit. Uh, inheriting a small kind of interstellar empire after succeeding his surrogate father. So very similar to what we see with the Ultramar we'll get to. But Dorn, Dorn is also known for his uh, infallible loyalty to the Emperor, just in the same way that Lehman Russ, you know. While at the same time, he's known for being somewhat emotionless. There's a lot of moments in the lore where Dorn just delivers a straight gut shot of truth that makes you, as a reader, cringe. You're like, oh, ah, Dorn, maybe not too much here, huh? We, they gotta come back for Christmas dinner, shit, man. But the Imperial Fists as a whole are known for their ability to fight sieges both defensively and offensively. They're masters of siegecraft, much in the same likeness of the Iron Warriors. And they're appointed, uh, he is appointed the Praetorian of Terra. Um, so it's up to Dorne really to safeguard and refit Holy Terra for the coming legions of Horus. And you're going to see this a lot as we go through. You're going to say, hey, what's the difference between those two legions? The difference is one's a loyalist and one's a traitor. Um, and depending on which side of the spectrum you fall on, that might mean a lot of different things. <laughs> if you're really about, if you're all about uh, Chaos Space Marines, Rogel Dorn is a traitor. <laughs> but it's important to note that because you're going to see some similarities. Iron Warriors and uh, not the Emperor's ch Children. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> Imperial Fists and Iron Warriors. You're going to see a lot of that in the Raven Guard and the Night Lords. Speaking of Night Lords, number seven, Conrad Kurz, the Night Haunter, the Lord of the Night Lords. He's really one of my personal favorites. Uh, Kurz hails from a planet called uh, Nostromo, and it's constantly decked in like just eternal darkness and filled to the brim with just crime and barbary. There's a lot to cover with Conrad, and our video on him will be pretty sizable. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna cover the Horus Heresy books on him, I'm gonna cover uh, Aaron Dembski Bowden's Soul Hunter trilogy on him, but Kurz had uh, premonitions into the future, and he sees these events such as the Emperor arriving on Nostromo, and he really sees his own death. And rising up from the gangs that fill Nostromo are the Night Lords, and these guys are known for this, their wide use of terror and hit and run tactics. They kind of fill the enemy with dread, and much in the same way that Kurz instilled order in Nostromo with this constant threat of death. But the Night Lords' history is very tragic and it's very far sweeping too it's really intense and i'm excited to go into that with you guys but uh we'll get we'll get to it when we do get to it it's if you can't tell i'm really excited to to do that video it will be probably the longest of all of them since i it, there's just such a rich history that uh aaron Dembski bowden covers in the soul hunter trilogy he, he really fleshes out a lot of the gaps that isn't that aren't covered in any of the horus heresy books because he kind of had that that liberty to create it since there wasn't a uh, um a pretense for it already but now the seventh or i'm sorry the ninth legion sanguinius the angel the blood angels and probably my favorite on the list itself um because i actually personally collect blood angels and paint them and play with them but that sounds weird but uh sanguinius was just really this figurehead for not just the imperium but for the primarchs as a whole you know while each of the primarchs has one or two features that really kind of show their their connection to their gene father the emperor uh sanguinius really embodies all aspects of the master of mankind uh his beautiful kind of noble cultured warrior warrior you know civilians and legionnaires alike all look on him uh his, his winged form with awe there's a lot of points in the book where they say oh it was hard to look at sanguinius in the same way it was hard for me to look at the emperor and it's really crazy to hear that space marines when they talk about the emperor like i, I it forced my head down i couldn't i couldn't look him in the in the face and i had the same feeling when i was talking to or in the presence of sanguinius and a lot of the other primarchs actually um kind of fall in line with sanguinius he's kind of like everyone's best friend everyone kind of both traitor and loyalist alike they're all like well you know what we got to get sanguinius on our side there's a lot of points in the in the uh books too where Horus is like, you're sure Sanguinius is going to join us, right? Because if we he doesn't, we can't win. Because he's kind of like, even Horus even says to Sanguinius, you should have been the War Master. This should have been you. And a lot of the other Primarchs kind of agree with that sentiment. Um, he's kind of like 
that one that it's like that one brother that everyone gets along with and just kind of flows through everyone it through flows through everything uh if you didn't have brothers i didn't get along with my tooler brother so i don't know what the hell i'm saying right now but um ball the home planet of the blood the blood angels produces some of the best space vampires this the imperium could ask for God, I love it. But uh, it's this highly kind of mechanized fighting force. Not in the same way that the White Scars are. The Blood Angels kind of incorporate a lot more fast attack, fast attack, hard hitting units in the sense that they've got a lot of drop pods, they've got a lot of these assault units, they've got bikes as well. Very, very kind of more shock troop esque, I'm a little more heavily armored. But outside of all these great qualities, though, there is one trait, well, eventually two, that the Blood Angels suffer from the most, and that's called the Red Thirst. It's a flaw in their gene seed that would overtake their legionnaires and uh, it just randomly does this too and uh, you reread in the books that basically sanguinius just kind of silences each one of them personally kills them himself but after the heresy a second kind of malediction befalls the chapter and that's called the black rage this is kind of psychic imprinting um, of their own father sanguinius's demise which eventually spawns the dreaded uh, death companies of the blood angels because they all go mad uh, reliving the moments in their own brain as if they think they're sanguineous. They take on some of his memories as well. It's just really kind of crazy, tragic, uh, kind of bestial end to some of the, the noble blood angels. Moving though over to the 10th legion, Ferris Manus, the Gorgon. And a lot of the worlds that Primarchs hail from have a lot of ancient Greek influences on their culture. And you can expect that same thing in a planet called Medusa, no doubt. But uh, Ferris Manus is a master weaponsmith who really embroiled himself deeply in the world of technology once the Emperor rediscovers him. But the Iron Fists are probably the closest legion to the Mechanicum. And the Mechanicum is basically this, this sect that works lives alongside the Imperium that is basically responsible for all of the technology of the Imperium. They, they don't call the Emperor the Emperor, they call him the omni -Sia. So they, they, it's kind of like the same, but not the same. It's a really weird distinction. But they, uh, the Iron Hands as a whole replace a lot of their body parts with augmented limbs and such, and they kind of see their skin as this weakness. And Ferris Manus and uh, Fulgrim were, were close friends, and they got in this kind of grand crafting duel. And, you know, it's, it was, who could make the most perfect weapon? And they each made one for one another, and they kind of cemented their friendship by the fires that forged their weapons. And you'll see uh, what becomes of that friendship, as the irony is pretty rich. You might, uh, lose your head for those of you who know the uh the lore that was a shitty pun <laughs> but uh the the 11th legion after them is another deleted legion so same story kind of falls in here we will kind of just kind of gloss past them quickly and on to uh angron uh the 12th legion the red angel the slave uh gladiator pits of new syria new caria n-u-c-e-r-i-a i'm gonna go with new syria was a uh, homeworld filled with combat, blood, and, and warfare. And the kind of uh, primitive implants, these, these primitive implants called the butcher's nails, were placed into the gray matter of a, a gladiator's brain. And this would kind of completely rewrite their synapses. Angron is a Primarch in constant pain as a result of these nails. So they were they were placed inside of him, and uh, basically the way it worked on New Syria, he kind of let a he kind of let a like a Spartan, I'm sorry, Spartacus esque. A revolt against the uh, ruling caste of that uh, planet but these implants grant the grant him and his whole legion these this kind of heightened aggression and the only ease for this pain is the release of adrenaline mid-combat um, the, the the world eaters themselves were known for their close combat skills far before they fell to becoming corn berserkers you know that this was in the great crusade they were known for this they're also known for their brutality and that's kind of something that they kind of were getting chided on and uh, stops on the wrist by the emperor so karn the uh, first captain of the world eaters has a kind of bloody history where he talks a lot about angron's constant need for combat that dips the whole legion as a in a mind-numbing kind of haze of constant war um, there's a lot of points in the uh, lore where anytime the main characters kind of see Karn. He's usually kind of like in a bit of a haze where he's like, huh, what? Yeah, what did you need? Like, as he kind of progresses more and more and more with the Butcher's Nails and releases himself more and more and more to their their dominance of him. And this happens to the Legion as a whole. The Legion's not necessarily 
present unless it's fighting. And it's really, really terrifying. Angron himself is, he does so many crazy things in the lore. Like there's one part where a whole entire Titan steps, almost like steps on him and he can hold it back. Like it's, it's awesome. But the Allegiant itself is kind of always thrown into the thickest part of the battle. And the world eaters are used as more of a meat grinder than the surgical knife of, that most Allegiants are. And uh, speaking of surgical knives, uh, we'll jump over to uh, our next one, the 13th Legion um, in Robut Giman. I never know how to pronounce that. I call him Bobby G, the uh, the Avenging Son. Now, of all the worlds that are the most like antiquity, uh, uh, Roman or, or Greek otherwise, McCrag kind of matches that of ancient Rome, the home of Bobby G in the system of Ultramar. And Ultramar is unique in that it almost becomes the home of the Imperium under the Imperium Secundus. And Bobby G is known for being a kind of a statesman and a tactician. He, he does a lot of uh, a lot of talking when it comes to bringing planets into the fold into the Imperium. In the books, the Ultramarines always talk about these practicals and theoreticals. Like, okay, hey, what's the theoretical? Great, what's the practical? And they have two different plans for every scenario. And that's kind of comes to their battle strand, battle plans or their strategies. But the Legion as a whole as well is, is the closest to a kind of a stock standard Legion and eventually becomes the blueprint for all the chapters after the Horus Heresy thanks to the Codex Astartes, uh, Astartes that... Uh, Bobby G sets down, and the Ultramarines have always kind of ranked amongst the uh, ranked among the amongst the largest of legions because uh, there, there, there's kind of some some mystery here, right? Even when they even the successor chapters, there, there's the most of uh, those with Ultramarines as their as their root. You know, there's a there's this kind of kind of like a, a rumor, partly rumor, partly kind of maybe a truth here that the two Primarchs that aren't on this list that are killed. It says that their, their legionnaires are inducted into Bobby G's, Bobby G's to kind of hide any suspicion here. So Robbie Gulo is sitting there on top of a large legion because of the kind of uh, treason of these other two. And, and that's mainly speculation uh, that's kind of like hinted at here and there in uh, some of the other uh, books. But it's a really cool kind of interesting uh, uh, conspiracy theory that I, I fall behind. I think it's pretty nifty. But number 14, Mortarian, the Death Lord. The uh, old Index of Stardust always has this uh, great start for Mortarian on the death world of Barbarus. Uh, much like Angron, uh, Mortarian fought against the tyrannical ruling caste of Barbarus. Uh, before he even could kill his adopted father, who had raised him, he succumbed to the toxins that filled the atmosphere of Barbarus. It's a, another death world, as we've just said. But this kind of spawned the Death Guard's willingness, and Death Guard is the, the legion of the that Mortarian is, is the head of, obviously, the 14th Legion. And this kind of spawns their willingness to use biological warfare on their foes. And this is a trend that would progress even after the Horus Heresy, you know. Already known for their resilience, the Death Guard are not known for any sort of highly characteristic traditions or colorful displays uh, until the really eventual fall to Nurgle, when the entire Legion essentially explodes in pestilent corruption, bringing or birthing the, uh, the Plague Marines. And before this, they're all very drab looking, very kind of plain. Even, even Mortarian himself, you can see here, is, is kind of boring, I guess you could say, looking compared to the other uh, Primarchs. He very, very kind of muted everything. Um, and it, much of his personality is very muted in the books, too. Uh, he has a lot, of, uh, a lot of interactions with the Great Khan, or especially uh, one whole fight. But for the most part, Mortarian is uh, kind of a subdued individual until you kind of see his motivations for why. They, they, they fall to Nurgle. Speaking of uh, people who fall to uh, traitor gods or, or to the ruinous powers, uh, number 15, Magnus the Red, the Crimson King. And now, if Ultramar is like Greece, then Prospero, his home planet, is much akin to something more Egyptian. Uh, Magnus united the land before the Emperor brought him into the fold. And that happens, it, it's, it's always kind of interesting with all these Primarchs. You've got some that unite it right as the emperor arrives or have united it and it's like oh emperor look at this look at this empire empire that i have built let me build yours but prospero was this kind of land of psychers and, and the divine there's a lot of mutants too but something that magnus kind of dabbled with himself was a lot of uh, psychic abilities and i say dabbled in the very loosest of terms because he would i would say he mastered it he basically become the most became the most proficient of all other primarchs when it came to psychic abilities the thousand sons 
uh, as a whole practice the, the Psyker abilities in every squad. They're sergeants being proficient sorcerers. And with the outlawing of Psyker abilities, this put a, a legion that was built around those set abilities in pretty hot water right out of the gate. And eventually, uh, Lehman Russ and Magnus kind of enter in a conflict that would uh, spell the future for, for both legions in a lot of ways. But moving over to probably one of the uh, most prolific on this list, uh, the 16th Legion, Horus Lupercal, the War Master, the Lord of what is well, eventually, uh, he starts off as the Lord of the Luna Wolves, but he is the first Primarch to be rediscovered by the Emperor on the planet of Chthonia. Uh, Horus quickly kind of rose to his father's side as his right hand as, as a result of just being the very first son, um, and that's kind of what is argued what makes him the, the lore master since he has like the longest time spent with the emperor uh, there's there's portions of the history where he finds horus like first and then there's a really long period before he finds the second one so horus and him do a lot of uh, spelunking together into lands fighting off like there's just this really cool part where in the first two books horus talks about uh the way him and the emperor are fighting like back to back against basically this massive massive like orc wah and how like the emperor almost gets like beaten up by a, an orc. It's pretty crazy to see how orcs are, are strong uh, unanimously across all universes, but it's pretty crazy how uh, how he describes this fight because it doesn't seem like it's the emperor fighting. It just seems like it's just another big primarch, so it's kind of cool here. But he's a uh, highly charismatic and a, kind of like a brilliant tactician. The Luna Wolves were known for their efficiency in bringing planets into the Imperium, into compliance at an extremely fast rate. Many, many times in the books, they, they kind of talk about how Horus can see these tactics and battles unfold that even other Primarchs can't match. He kind of sees it all in his, in his mind. There's a lot of like like sweeping bravado where he says, now do this, Legate, blah, blah, blah. My, my lord, oh, I said to do it. And he does it. And it's, oh, I told you it would work. It's a lot of that kind of crap happens. But it's really kind of cool the way you read it in the book because he, he does really know everything down to the T. And the Luna Wolves change names a couple times here. Uh, when the heresy starts, they become the Sons of Horus. Then afterwards, the Black Legion, a name taken in shame, really, for their, their failure to supplant the Emperor. And the Black Legion is like the, the chaos version of the Ultramarines, you know? Just kind of like a highly disciplined, otherwise vanilla fighting force. It's like, oh, chaos undivided? Here's your Black Legion. Ultramarines without any kind of bells and whistles, or I'm sorry, Space Marines with any kind of bells and whistles on them? Ultramarines. So, Horus's story is actually kind of a a tragic one, almost like a, a coming to age tale. Um, and you really learn to relate with his position the more and more the Horus Heresy novels progress. You, you hate him to begin with because you're like, oh, because of him all this bad stuff happens. But as you even read the first two books, you realize um, how charismatic he is and how a lot of other um, Primarchs, even if they don't like him, respect him a lot. So it's really, I'm going to have a lot of fun telling you guys a lot about uh, Horus Looper Call here. But we can't talk about Horus if we don't talk about the 17th Legion, Lorgar Aurelian, uh, bearer of the word. Um, now, obviously, the leader of the word bearers. Now, Colchis also shares a pretty Egyptian themed society like Prospero, uh, even being described as an arid desert land. But much of Lorgar's initial idolatry for the emperor comes from the zealous nature of the inhabitants of Colchis towards their, their pantheon of gods. And he's really regarded as really the first. Heretic. Lor Lorgar is what leads Horus to the dark side and, and the heresy as a whole. And the Wordbearer Legion itself was originally known for its kind of fanatic devotion to the Emperor before it fell to the ruinous powers. Um, once it did, though, all sorts of demon possession, all sorts of communion with the dark gods, like the word bearers, are, or bearers, I'd say, are the forefront in demon possession. Like the very first kind of chaos space marines come from the word bearers. Lorgar sends like basically like the ship out into what is the Eye of Terror and they all the inhabitants of the ship become uh, possessed. Now, I want to kind of hold a little bit off of what happens there, but basically that's the beginning of, of a true chaos uh, space marine in one way or another as far as being completely pulled away from the light of the Emperor. But very important, very, very important. Although I, I'll be totally honest, I hated Lorgar. I thought he was like the weakest and most boring of all the Primarchs until I read uh, The First Heretic and the, the Betrayer, the, kind of like a two-part Aaron Dembski-Bowden series about uh, Lorgar and his, and you understand a lot more of why he is the way he is once you read those books. And we'll go into why he is the way he is <laughs> in that video. 
Now for the 18th Legion, Vulcan, the Lord of Drakes, or the, the Salamander's Legion as we know it. And if anyone could match or really even surpass the blacksmithing ability of uh, Ferris Manus, uh, Vulcan would really be it. You know, he's born in this forge world of Nocturne, and Vulcan single-handedly drives off this raiding party of Dark Eldar with, with two hammers, you know. And Dark Eldar are space Dark Elves for those that are of the uninitiated. But he's kind of forged in fire and strength, this very archetypical blacksmith. And uh, Vulcan has suffered quite a bit during the Horus Heresy. He almost kind of looks like uh, Tyrael from uh, Diablo 2 and 3, if you remember those games. How could you not? But the Salamander's Legion follows that example that their Primarch sets out for them. You know, resolute strength matched with a gratuitous amount of flames. You know, the Salamanders, along with the Iron Hands and the, and the soon-to-be-discussed Raven Guard, uh, all fought a, a pretty uphill battle throughout the heresy at the hands of the traitors. But Vulcan's story is probably one of the most unique of the bunch. And uh, it's, it's hard to kind of even give you a preview of what that's like without even going to everything. But he, he definitely is by and far one of the uh, craziest Primarchs as far as uh, what happens to him. But number 19 here, Corvus Korax, the Raven Lord. And Corvus has this really cool upbringing on the mining planet of Lysias, or later renamed uh, Deliverance once he takes it over. But all these Primarchs essentially learn the traits that then dominate their legion from their early upbringing, and, and well, at least most of it. But these, the, uh, these abilities of being like stealthy. Corvus had to use stealth and guerrilla warfare tactics while in the mines. And this is how he overtook the planet and claimed it for his own. And that is what then influenced the Raven Guard. They, they, the Raven Guard had this really brutal history as one of the loyalist legions that suffered greatly during the, the drop site uh, massacre of Isfahan. And when the Horus Heresy kind of really picked up steam at that point, that's when, oh man, these these legions that we thought were loyalists were actually traitors, and they just massacred three whole legions. And they are matched by the, the Night Lords on the side of the ho side of Horus for their kind of stealthy tactics as well, like I was saying. Iron Warriors match the uh, Imperial Fists, Night Lords kind of match the Raven Lord, or I'm sorry, uh, the Raven Guard, in the sense that they're both kind of these hit-and-run, stealthy kind of harassment-type uh, legions. But, of course, the Raven Guard don't flay people alive like the Night Lords do, but that's how they're here over there. The, uh, the lengths, though, that Corvus goes to to try and rebuild his legion, uh, we'll, we'll go over that in the respective video, but it's it's very kind of uh, grim, definitely very grim dark, kind of has a little bit of a Cthulhu vibe to it. But uh, Corvus Corax does have also a little bit of an Edgar Allan Poe touch on him that will that will go in that video as well, you know. Uh, guy named the Raven Lord, why, why would he not be linked to Edgar Allan Poe, huh? That, that'd be foolish, that'd be foppish. But um, we'll round out our last... Uh, Primarch here in the 20th Primarch, Alpharius Omegon, the last Primarch. That is, that's his title, okay? That's not me just saying the last Primarch, like I already just said. But Alpharius Omegon is the twin Primarch of the Alpha Legion, and he's the most secretive of the, they are the most secretive of the bunch. And it's actually kind of probably, it's probably appropriate to say he because of the way that they deliver themselves. Um, there's not a ton to divulge about them, not like just yet. I'll do more in the video, obviously, but with even their homeworld is a mystery. Uh, the Legion is known as essentially being the, the CIA of the fledgling Imperium, you know. They're involved in so many plots and schemes, and he's also the smallest of the Primarchs. He matches the size of his Legionnaires, and it makes him even harder to uh, distinguish because he, he it's it's an intentional. So basically what the what the deal here is that you he would he would arrive to like, oh, I'll go meet up with my other brother Primarchs and have one of his other Legionnaires go in and greet the Primarch. And then step out from from the honor guard and say, "Oh no, it's me, guys." So there's a lot of that going along. Um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of that that goes on because the, even all of the uh, even all the legionnaires say, "I am Alpharius." That's their that's their war chant. I am Alpharius. So it's like you can't really tell who the hell is who in that legion. That's kind of kind of a little bit of the craziness of it. And we'll go into their role in the heresy as well because. They, they, they kind of get this influence from the Cabal, and the Cabal, we'll talk about it, it's this kind of alien faction that has the greater good in mind. We've, we've kind of barely touched on them with uh, Lionel Johnson and the Watchers in the Dark, but uh, they're they're worth bringing up, and definitely Vulcan's story and an Alpharius Omegon story. But that kind of concludes everything for here today, guys. Uh, I just wanted to go real quick over every single Primarch, just a real quick brushing up on them, so when I bring up 
Um, maybe when I talk about Sanguinius and I say how close he was to uh, the Great Khan, or if I talk about how uh, him and uh, Horus got along, you'll at least understand who these players are. This is kind of like my Dramatis Personae. When you open up any of these Horus Heresy books, it's got a whole big roster of who's in the book. This is that kind of that appendix, as it is, of uh, basically who you're going to be dealing with in the next 19, 18 videos of uh, the uh, Primarch series here. But thanks for watching, guys. If you do have anything you want to throw in about any of these guys or which ones you want to see first, go ahead and make a comment. More than uh, more than happy to take your suggestions. I've, I think right now the, the biggest one on the list is Conrad Kurz, uh, and I'm I'm more than okay with that. That's what I, the one I think people want to see the most, uh, and I think right after it is Sanguinius, which happened to be my two favorites. So it works out for me. Lehman Russ is third on the list from what I can see, but make some clamor, make some shouts. Let me know in the comments what you want to see next. But uh, thanks for watching here today, guys. Have a good one and take care.